Good evening, dear viewers. Um, today we meet to have a very special discussion meeting. Welcome to this discussion program of uh, TV Metro Mail Canada. And we will be discussing about contemporary issues. But before we do that, let me um, call my guests. Um, and then we will go into the discussion. Hello, everyone. Hi. Today, we will discuss protecting civilians during war. Is international law enough? And to discuss this, our very special guest today is Professor Roland Rich. I'm so happy you could make it. And um, he is the Professor Roland Rich is the director for United Nations and Global Policy Program at the School of Political Science in Rutgers University. Prior to that, he was the uh, director of the National Democracy Fund, United Nations Democracy Fund, and also was um, worked at the Foreign Ministry of Australia, and he has been an advisor on foreign affairs, and, um, and particularly he's my teacher. Welcome, welcome, Roland. Thank and you, Christina. We also have um, Shoikot Rushdi, uh, my friend. He is um, a political analyst and he's joining from Toronto. Roland is joining from New York. And we have Imamul Haq, uh, the CEO of TV Metro Mail. And also he is also um, worked in uh, United Nations programs. So today is a sad day for the world because there are conflicts everywhere. But this is not how it should have been, Roller. Like in, after the Second World War, the world got together and said, never again, and tried to get together. And then over and over again, there has been conflicts. And the people who die, who are suffering most, are not the ones who bear arms. It's women and children. And today, we want to show respect to all these people who are dying in numbers in Palestine, in Gaza, and Ukraine. And why does it have to be like this? Aren't there laws that could protect the, the civilian population? Yes, um, we are certainly seeing um, two terrible conflicts taking place right now. Ironically, um, academics have called the period since the end of the Second World War the long peace. And even though that long peace has been punctuated by all sorts of wars in different parts of the world, it's been called the long peace because the major powers have not gone to war against each other. And um, in a sense, we, we give thanks for that. But what has tended to happen is that it's been the surrogates of the major powers that often have been um, fighting. And the role of the major powers is sometimes questionable in these situations. Now, um, the, the issue of the protection of civilians is one of the most fundamental um, aspects of humanitarian law. And um, the Geneva Conventions of 1948, which have um, articulated and, and um, uh, uh, basically have the foundation, created the foundation for humanitarian law, um, makes the protection of civilian a central concept, a central concept. Um, now, 
Law, of course, as we know, um, is the law of nations. It's called international law. Um, and it tends to favor nations. It was created by nations. And so the protection of civilians is not absolute, is not absolute, insofar as the, the overriding rule that um, is accepted by international law is in, um, is in Article 51 of the Charter. It's the inherent right of self-defense. And it's inherent because it's not the Charter that has granted this right. This right exists as natural law. Um, and, and the problem with the protection of civilians under humanitarian law is that it can conflict with this rule. The response of international law has been to say, of course, nations have the inherent right of self-defense, but in exercising their rights, they must do their utmost to limit damage to civilian areas and to avoid casualties among civilians. And um, we're in a, a situation now, I, I guess, you know, because we're in the heat of the moment, it's like the fog of war, in a sense. Um, it's hard to know whether um, Israel is doing the utmost in, in this situation. We certainly have the evidence of many civilians dying. Um, we certainly have the evidence of many civilians being displaced. Um, and I, I think, as a lawyer, what I would say is the onus is on Israel to show the world that what it is doing is absolutely necessary as an inherent right of self-defense and that they are doing their utmost to limit civilian casualties because clearly there are civilian casualties and I think Israel needs to explain how that's happened. Well, uh, in this regard, I have a question that um, what are the major challenges in enforcing international uh, law in uh, conflict situations and conflict zones? Like uh, what we have seen so far uh, since the um, Second World War that the uh, 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 international law people most people uh, doesn't know that whether uh, people don't know that whether there is a law actually in effect because uh, we have seen that air yeah, transportation law is in effect sea laws are in effect and wto laws are in effect but the international law to prohibit any kind of conflict like war situation where the severely civilians are uh, most uh, suffering so like we have seen this international law has not stop any conflict rather uh, it is mostly always in favor of waste like when you see in africa what happens and what happens in uh, east europe like serbia whether both sides bosnian and serbian there were criminals are being tried in an international criminal court but and when um, in uh, afghanistan iraq and libya are bombed by west uh, there's no uh, international law was in effect so people have uh, doubt whether there is an international law in effect, what are the challenges and why yeah. it is uh, not favoring the other side of the, of the uh, you know, wars, or not, they're not in war, they're the civilians. Why the other side, non-West, why they're not being protected and why the West is always getting that excuse, then there's no war criminal so far tried from the West. Okay, um, <laughs> these are um, large questions. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Um, international law uses the language and techniques of the law as we know it in the domestic situation, um, but it is, of course, only analogous to domestic law. It is different insofar as international law does not have the same um, enforcement capacity as domestic law does. And... Um, because it's international law and the nations created it and so forth, um, obviously their influence over international law is very strong. I would quibble with you about the use of the term the West. I think a better concept is the major powers. Exactly. They benefit from um, the way international law is 
uh, um, applied. And that's largely because in the design after the Second World War, the design for the international system was that it would be the, that peace would be guaranteed by the great powers. And the great powers gave themselves the privilege of being able to decide in the Security Council what action should be taken, um, in particular, mandatory action under Chapter 7 of the Charter. And we know this as the veto power. Mm -hmm. um, and um, so I, I, it's true that of the five permanent members, three are from the West and two are not, but I don't think that's the distinction. I think the distinction is yes. the major powers have an advantage in the system. And, and I, I guess that reflects the world. Um, it's, you know, ever since Thucydides wrote the history of the Peloponnesian War, um, he noted that the strong prevail and the weak must bear the consequences. And we still see that uh, um, today. International law tries to put a, a set of rules on the behavior of nation states, including the major powers. And occasionally those rules might um, might bite. I mean, I did, you know, we all noticed that um, a warrant for the arrest of the president of Russia was issued by the International Criminal Court um, for breaking, egregiously breaking the humanitarian law rule of not kidnapping your enemy's children. Um, now, that warrant uh, um, has obviously not been put into effect. But, you know, if, if I were Vladimir Putin, I'd be pretty careful where I travel. <laughs> yeah, but then again, that, as you said, does it have the, the, bite, the bite? I mean, it, the, there are international laws, but then the international laws are being um, dealt with by the nations. And then it is... Yeah. I mean, a lot of it is on the goodwill of the nations, and that yeah. is where probably there is a bit of failing. Uh, Imam, you had a yeah. question. Uh, uh, let me try to be very brief because um, I know I, we have to be very brief. We need to cover a lot of things. Uh, one thing is this morning, because we have today a, a talk, you know, where we will be discussing about the laws, whether those are enough to protect civilians. So I invited some of my friends, those are from different part of the world. I mean, from not from the West. Most of them, they said, that is your cup of tea because the laws are only for the Western and wealthy nations. So that doesn't you know, interest us that much. So you discuss those, not for, those are not for us. Yeah. So the first part of my question, what do you have to say to them? Because those who do not have trust or confidence, uh, confidence on those laws, this is first. And you mentioned about when we were discussing about laws, you talked about the, as you said, that the onus is on Israel, whether they are killing civilians or not indiscriminately. So the second part of the question is, how does all these humanitarian laws or international laws applies to this current crisis or war, the Israel and um, Gaza? And what are its, you know, core values or principles? That's the yeah. two thing. Yeah. Thank you. Yes. So, <clears throat> Imam, let me first make a comment about international law. You know, being in international law and having been the, the, the legal advisor to the foreign ministry for, for a time, I feel I need to somehow defend my discipline. Um, we take for granted the fact that every single day, hundreds if not thousands of international law rules and treaties are being respected in aviation, shipping, trade, phytosanitary matters, um, uh, um, health matters, in all sorts of areas, international law's imprint on the world is strong. But people tend to ask, fine, but what about on peace and security? And of course, that is where international law is sort of the most vulnerable because it runs against um, the interests of major states. Uh, um, and so, you know, to impose international law in that situation is very difficult. 
the the question you ask um, about um, you know civilians, um, I think what Israel would say, and I'm not a spokesperson for Israel at all, but what they will say is they are simply exercising their inherent right of self-defense and they are attacking military positions. Mm -hmm. They'll then go on to say that, um, and the, their enemies, Hamas and other groups in, in Gaza, are surrounding themselves with civilians to try to dissuade Israel from hitting those positions. Now, humanitarian law um, uh, is of the view that even if the civilians are, are uh, um, used yeah. as human shields, they are still protected. Yes, sir. Mm -hmm. They are still protected, even if they're used as human shields. I guess a distinction might be made if they are volunteering to be mm -hmm. human shields. If they are volunteering to be human shields, then and maybe the they them. are part of the war effort. Mm -hmm. But if they are involuntarily being used as hum human shields, then they are protected and Israel must make every effort not to, not to harm so, those people. How, you know, the way these things work, Imam, is this, that in the fog of war in which we are, we never get the answers. And we the get answers, different versions. We get different versions. We get a lot of propaganda. We get a lot of accusations. We tend to get to the truth months, if not years later, when, when there are sober inquiries by people of stature that look at these things and weigh up the evidence and tell us um, what's you know what is happening. We, we there will be international uh, um, fora that do this, and I believe um, within the Israeli system they will also uh, undertake these sort of reviews. So we will get to the answer, but it's very hard to have the answer in the fog of war. I think I think we have the similar kind of question, uh, Christina. If you just like to yes, the, uh, we have a question from Nusrat Swati. The law of war is non-reciprocal, meaning it would apply irrespective of what the other side has done. Given that by deliberately targeting civilians or imposing collective punishment over civilians, can Israel justify that the other party has? committed violation. You probably answered that question that we do not have a straight answer to that yet. But but, but I do want to talk about the siege idea um, uh, because that's another um, concept that comes from humanitarian law and, and the um, illegality of collective punishment to deal with a, a perceived um, wrong. Um, I thought Israel was wrong in law and wrong in terms of winning, trying to win the support of the international community in using the term siege and announcing that that's what it was doing. Um, and um, I, I think it, it was because it was done in the heat of the moment and it had the sound of retaliation, which is not part of inherent self-defense. Retaliation exactly. is not inherent self-defense. And, and I think what we are now seeing is more rational decisions. Um, the UN Relief and Works Agency is now receiving uh, um, humanitarian goods, distributing it, maybe not enough. Um, I, I think Israel has an obligation to allow the fresh water back into Gaza because obviously civilians can't survive without mm -hmm. it. Um, so I think they've got to... Um, be very careful with their words, and they've got to stop using this term siege. Uh, it may work with the Israeli public, but it doesn't work with the international, international public. population. Definitely. In this regard, I have a question that the same thing happening here when you mentioned that the Israel has the, like, in, according to the international law, right to defend, as well as, and most people, and particularly in the Western um, uh, state leaders, always say that first, then they say, we are really a very... Uh, uh, sympathetic to the Palestinian cause because Palestine does not have any uh, right to defend because they are non-state actors. That is my question. The first part, and the second part. Okay, first you tell us whether the state and non-state actors. Yeah. 
Yeah. The non -state so, actors are not getting the right to defend. Why? Yeah. So it's a terrific question. And the international community sort of grappled with this question in the 1960s and 70s when the decolonization mm -hmm. movements were happening. And all over the world, there were national liberation movements um, that um, were fighting colonial powers. And the answer of the international community was in was achieved through amending the 1948 conventions with the 1978 protocols, which so basically did this. No, the national liberation movements do not have a right of inherent self-defense, but they benefit from the same humanitarian law protections as nation states and the civilians of nation states do. So, um, you know, just because they are trying to overthrow the colonial government doesn't mean that you can, you know, um, um, execute them without trial or, or treat them as non-humans, basically. You've still got to abide by humanitarian law in dealing with them. And I think we can project that to, to today. Um, Gaza and the West Bank do not have an inherent right of self-defense. It's inherent to the nation state. But obviously they have all sorts of protections under international law, including humanitarian law. Um, and um, that's, what, that's what the debate will be about, whether or not those protections have been effective and whether or not they have been able to avail themselves of those protections. And then the question comes to me, and it is part, the Palestinian territories are not an independent country. It is not a non, it is a non state territory. In fact, it is part of Israel because Israel in 1967 war occupied those territories and allowed them to have a self-governed. So what is happening there? It's like a chicken coop. And then you are bombing in that coop in, in your own ear. So within the territory of 306 kilo, square kilometer, 2.2 million people in Gaza, they have been bombarded 6,000 times in last seven days. What, while U.S. have bombarded 6,000 in one full year in Afghanistan, which is 1,800 times more than the Gaza size, and there's 3.2 million people in West Bank, they are also Palestinian territory. So this is the scenario. So can people equate very carefully, because it is our war should be, as you mentioned, more careful than the bullet, the sniper's bullet, that... <laughs> The yeah. concentration camps by uh, occupied territories of uh, yeah. Germany and they're in their own territory, Germany has the Nazi concentration camp. It's like the yeah. same I'm feeling. If people, most of the people feel like that, how international law will uh, actually debate with that or support with that? Yeah. So international law doesn't say a lot about this. Um, Israel is the occupying power and it has obligations as the occupying power. That, that's clear. Uh, sometimes it fulfills those obligations, sometimes it does not. But let me just take my lawyer's hat off for a moment and, and put more of a political science hat on for, for a moment. Yes, in 67, um, Israel um, ended up um, capturing vast amounts of territory um, in the West Bank and the Sinai. Um, and has not given those back because it says it will only do so in a negotiated uh, a process. Um, now, it's interesting. I I've, I've remember following and I visited in this period, um, in the period of the late 60s and especially in the 70s and, and early 80s, the Palestinians in the occupied territories, bit by bit, started to become integrated into the Israeli economy. Um, and in many ways, the standard of living and the benefits to the Palestinians was far better than under Jordanian rule. Um, in fact, I, I had a, 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 a friend, or an acquaintance, she was doing a Palestinian woman, she was doing a PhD at an American um, university, and she honestly said to me, she grew up in Bethlehem in this period, she admired the Israeli society and she admired Israeli women because they were so assertive, so strong. That was, she sort of modeled herself on those. Now, you can understand if you are an absolutist among the Palestinians, this is a very bad development. This is a normalization 
of the occupation. This is an acceptance of the subjugation of that territory to Israeli rule by the people themselves. And um, the various sort of groups obviously saw this as something they had to put an end to. They tried politically. It didn't really work. Ultimately, they thought they only had one weapon, and that was violence. And maybe Israel overreacted to that violence. I think that's probably right. But certainly the, the, the violence was the way that the Palestinian groups decided to stop the normalization of the occupation. And once there's a cycle of violence, it's very hard to put an end to it. It's very hard to put an end to it, and we're still living with it. Um, I think the, um, the, there is an element here, though, that's quite interesting. Um, the Hamas statements that we're hearing, especially from their spokesman in Beirut, their intention was to begin an uprising all over the, the Arab world and, am and among other Palestinians. That We haven't seen that yet. We haven't seen that yet. Um, and, and so, in, in a sense, their tactic, maybe it'll still come, their tactic has failed. Um, and, um, and another thing they say, uh, I, I was surprised to hear this, they say that they didn't intend to cause as much damage as they did in Israel or to take that many hostages. But I'm sorry, if you do this sort of violent action, you're responsible for all the consequences. You can't say, well, we didn't intend this to happen. Um, it, it flowed from their actions and whether others joined and, and, and it wasn't Hamas regulars is frankly, is frankly irrelevant. Um, so, you know, I, I know it doesn't sound um, pleasing to say that there's problems on both sides, but for the Palestinian extremists or absolutists, violence is their weapon and Israel responds, you know, with a state response to this non-state violence. But, well, uh, but that sets a bad precedence. Yeah, but that sets yeah. precedence and, uh, and also could happen elsewhere because these statements of uh, nationalism seems to be, you know, becoming more and we are coming uh, across with hybrid nations a lot around the world. Uh, I so, just want to point out one thing that they, uh, uh, one of the international media told that uh, the number of Hamas people are like around 15,000 out of 2.2 million in the Gaza area. And uh, they're, they're initially they were elected uh, by the local people, the Palestinians. So what happens here, uh, I'm seeing at the Time magazine online that 1,400 people are killed in Israel every kill, murder, every killing is very deplorable. And more than 7,000 Palestinians are killed since seven, October 6, 7. What happens? And 281 is still unnamed because when President Biden, one of the major power definitely, uh, said the doubtful about the number of people died in Gaza, then they provide the name 6,747 and 281 unnamed yet to be identified. That is the, and I'm not going to that debate. Five times more people are dead. Definitely, most of them are civilians. And the scenarios we have discussed, but my first point here, one objection with your use of one word, because you said we should be very careful. And from your point of view, or from the Western point of view, it could be economic integration of the Palestinians with Israel, but the other side of the coin might say it is the dependence on them in an apartheid country, and not me. It is uh, Jimmy, Jimmy Carter, former U.S. president, says, uh, Palestine, peace, not apartheid. They are segregated. They have no e exit from Gaza and West Bank, except through Israel. Only one or two uh, areas, they have restricted gates with Jordan and Egypt. So they are dependent economically, socially, their water, their electricity, their telecommunication, their internet is uh, close today. So they're dependent in a segregated society. It is a modern apartheid. Do you um, uh, differ with my uh, observation here? Because it is uh, coming yeah. out of this, uh, discussion. You know, I try to be careful with words. Um, um, you know, I'll give you an example. Um, I really dislike and I've stopped using the term terrorist. 
Um, everybody calls their enemy a terrorist now. Um, everywhere in the world, the enemy is the terrorist. And, and the implication is that once you call a group or an individual a terrorist, that person is a non-human, no longer has any rights, and we can do whatever we want to them. And, and I'm hearing all the Israelis, they all call them terrorists. And I, I don't think, you know, it's, it's a useful word. Um, there's another word that's being used, that, that Gaza is fighting a colonial situation. That's an unhelpful word. It's an unhelpful concept. Um, uh, um, it, yes, let's use the right word, occupation. That's the correct word. Um, but, but, you know, um, and by the same reason, apartheid, I don't think is, a, is the word we should use because it carries so much luggage with it from the South African uh, situation. Once again, these are occupied people. Um, and the occupying power has obligations towards the occupied people. That's the reality of it. And by using sort of the international law words, we try to dial down the heat rather than, than escalating. escalated and, by using words like terrorism, colonialism. And, and that sets unhealthy precedents for anywhere else because around the world there would be people who probably differ with whoever is ruling the uh, pockets of people and that would create uh, more um, possibilities. And the, the organization that we are talking about, we have mentioned it several times, United Nations, is something that people look up to as if there could be solutions. But I kind of sometimes I, with the tongue in my cheek, I say it's basically a club of nations who believe in the Westphalian theory, like my border, my ruling, I'll do what I want, and these are my people. And sometimes these are whatever I do within the border might not be as good for the people within it. But then United Nations is a club of such Westphalian states. So how can that change? Can, can I just, uh, you know, add something with that? If we just uh, try to listen to the, you know, different ambassadors, uh, you know, speech during this last three, four days over Israel and Gaza war, this is very frustrating. It is so, so much, you know, polarized that you can easily understand that, say, for example, the, the civilians, uh, you know, the sufferings, one part will only talk about their civilians. The other part will only talk about their civilians. This is then why we should, uh, you know, talk to these kind of issues in the UN system, because all nations are there. We are not sympathizing to other nations. That is very frustrating for many people. But anyway, that is kind of what is happening in the world because you win election by saying, "Not this is what I am going to do. I am against X." So why wins by being against X? And that is becoming a norm. And that is scary. And I mean, we look up at you know, something called United Nations, but what could United Nations be, have done better? It's the United Nations. Well, you know, I'll go even further, Christina. Uh, you say it's a club of nation states. It's actually a club of the governments of those nation states. Exactly. That's yes. Right. Uh, yes. Um, it's a club of governments and they and they are clubby. You know, they understand each other and they want to monopolize all power um, as governments. And and um, you know we need to break that monopoly. We need to break that monopoly because what you get is a, a very stilted view of what the nation is all about. The nation is more than a government. Exactly. The nation is a much broader phenomenon than a government. And, of course, it's difficult to represent that. But in um, my proposal, in a book I published recently, is that alongside the General Assembly of Governments that we have now, we need a General Assembly of Civil Society and a General Assembly of the Business World. And they will represent the international community in a way that a club of governments cannot. 
Um, and and we, you know, I, I think we would get a much more vibrant and coherent debate rather than the very stale and ugly debates we now hear at the UN, um, uh, which basically, Imam, I agree with you, we all know what they're going to say before they say it. There's and there's, they're trying to please thing. their own coterie, their, their little, um, their own, uh, you know, people. Political it, power base, mostly. It, exactly. They, uh, um, they speak to their own base. Um, you know, I, I'd, they, I'd like to think they, they speak to their own nations or for their nations, but it's, it goes well below that. They speak to a little group that is paying attention to this and, and that group sort of has a stranglehold. So, look, the UN, because it's a club of governments and the governments completely dominate the UN, um, it's not a design that's going to work for, for very much longer, to be quite honest. Um, and we're seeing for all the good things the UN has done over the years, um, it is not fit for purpose anymore the way it is, it is designed. Um, unfortunately, um, the veto power of the permanent members of the Security Council ends all discussion of, of reform. Um, and, and reform is like an oxymoronic word at the UN. UN reform doesn't come, go together because it is in the interest of the permanent five members to th leave things exactly as they are. Yeah, because it, it's, it's that's, why, you know, that's why, Roland, that's why there is a question. Like, you know, though we are saying there's a, you know, the uh, club of the all nations or the government, but there are few nations or few governments they are dominating. That's why even today, we have uh, the UN General Assembly, they have, you know, uh, passed a resolution, but uh, that has doesn't make any sense, probably because it is not a legal binding. Right? Yeah, it cannot have a legal, it doesn't have the, the power no, to it, execute. It, it has moral power and, and it has political power, but only the Security Council can actually have That's mandatory right. power. Um, uh, and, and they jealously guard that power. And it's a sort of understandable. That's the, that's the design of the UN. And, and, you know, of course, that design is based on the failure of the League of Nations, which didn't have that. It had a unanimity rule, which didn't work. So they've sort of amended it to be the, the, the new UN, the UN 2.0, the UN we know, is a UN guaranteed by the great powers. And as part of that guarantee, they give themselves all sorts of privileges. So how can that be corrected? Is there any way, pathway? Okay. Um, look, we can't turn this planet into heaven. No. We will always have conflict. Um, we can't pretend that somehow or another, you know, uh, we can design a, a system where there won't be conflict anymore. We will live with conflict forever because we are humans and that's what we do. Exactly. Um, um, we, we, so we, we have to sort of find some other more realistic way of doing things. My, in my book, I propose and I give a path to how to achieve this, that the veto be limited only to chapter seven of the charter and that the and that the five permanent members do not have the power to veto a new secretary general or veto an agenda or be able to have other influence of a veto type in the un and that what they can veto is is mandatory action under chapter seven and in a sense that protects their national interests but at least this will allow the un to have a proper debate about what the UN should look like and make decisions about it without the fear that all this discussion or debate would be for naught. Uh, can um, I just ask one thing, Ronald? Because uh, uh, shall we'll we? Go... Yeah. Okay. Shall we? Uh, because we have already moved to Roland's book, and that has quite a few directions that we can talk about. But we generally take a short uh, break. So if we take that seconds. short. 30 seconds commercial break and then we'll come back and then we'll come to your question, Imam. Okay, okay, thank you. Welcome to N. Jahan Legal Professional Corporation.
At Enjahan Legal Professional Corporation, we take the time to understand your concerns and find the best possible path going forward. Welcome back to our discussion, which is quite uh, an interesting discussion that we're having with Professor Roland Rich and with us is Shaykot and Imam. Before we went into the break, Imam, you were about to ask a question in relation to what the Professor Rich UN. just mentioned about UN. The recent the day before yesterday in the Security Council, the France was uh, applied his veto power. But today during the General Assembly, it, it uh, you know it has given his uh, you know vote uh, in favor of you know all the nations there so i am a bit confused that you know in security council you are not uh, supporting something but in general assembly you are supporting something what does it make how do you explain that imam i am not going to be a, a, a apologist or an explainer of government decisions okay. especially okay. in other government decisions okay. um, but but what we do all know is Hypocrisy is no stranger to government decision making. <laughs> That's right. Okay. Okay. Let's move to. Totally uh, agreed. <laughs> yeah. But, okay. but, uh, but I wanted to discuss some of the things that you proposed in your book uh, because, uh, quite correctly, you call UN the Libyathan of, of, so it's, it's antiquated. So you, you are proposing a new way of doing that things. And uh, what could be the steps? Because I, I want to draw a different analogy, like in the, in the case of health and with COVID, what we hadn't seen in many years with the, with the Westphalian mode, people were pushed to work together and they have something called the Gavi Alliance and all that. So the business people, the uh, researchers, the universities, Everybody is kind of working because it was a huge catastrophe that the world saw. It does that set a kind of a stepping stone to possibilities? You know, you, you, the example you give is a terrific example um, insofar as um, the global fund for AIDS, hepatitis, malaria, uh, 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 tuberculosis, malaria, the Gavi Alliance and so forth, all include the private sector. Yes, and 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 frankly, the, these organisations have private sector values of evidence-based decision making, trial and error, getting things right, trying to get proper metrics to measure things and so forth. Not like governments who always want to claim credit for success, whether it's there or not. Um, so, or just depend on words that fly in the air. Exactly, I, I, you know so. I think that's a terrific example of why we need to bring both civil society and the business world into global governance. We are living in a world where you cannot solve problems at the national level anymore. The Correct. problems transcend the national level. We have we need global governance, not a global government that's beyond us and it's almost unimaginable but we need global governance. Where norms and, work. And we need a strong institution to make global governance work. This UN can't do it, but we do need a UN that will be that strong institution. That's why I call for the UN Leviathan. Yep. I'm using the, the Thomas Hobbes idea of the national Leviathan and trying to use that analogy to the global level. But, but don't get me wrong. I don't want a, a world government. I can't conceive how you would get there or what it would look like. And, and the last thing we need is a world government that has a monopoly on the use of force. Yes, uh, and then, um, then have a world autocrat. That would be the ultimate worst. <laughs> exactly. So I think, you know, whether we like the Westphalian system or not, we're going to live with it for a long time mm -hmm. yet. But we need to tame it. We need to govern it in a better way. And, and we need to, to govern it and tame it from the base 
and from the international, supranational, global level as well. Uh, as, okay. Um, so I have ahead. a question in yeah. this regard that uh, because you mentioned about this strengthening of institutions. As well, you also mentioned that a, an arrest warrant was issued against the, one of the major powers uh, leader, uh, that is uh, Mr. Putin. So uh, we have seen that the International Criminal Court was uh, established under uh, the UN supervision, and it's, it has 123 member countries right now, but several other countries are signatories, but they have not ratified. And major powers like Russia, China, Russia, China, and United States, they are not, even yes. They are not actually ratified or signatory of this International Criminal Court. So it is a kind of handicapped organization. It is not a strong organization. They have the power to only try Rwandans and some Serbians. So far we have seen, isn't it? We've got to start somewhere. And, and just because we don't have the perfect court doesn't mean we shouldn't have an international court, criminal court, that tries to do things. That's the way law has developed, you know, incrementally we increase the powers. Look at the human rights system we have today. Um, in the beginning, it was just one document, the, the, the 1948 uh, uh, declaration. Um, but now we have all sorts of different instruments, rapporteurs that visit countries and, and give reports on what's going on there. We have committees that receive complaints from individuals in countries and make decisions on those complaints. Um, we've got all sorts of new mechanisms to try to improve human rights. Not that, 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 that we've, again, we haven't made heaven on this earth, but we are trying to improve things. And it's the same with international criminal law. You've got to start somewhere and let's try to make what we're doing now a success. And then that will encourage others to, to join. Um, um, you know, I would not like to be a head of state or head of government that has an arrest warrant against me. Um, the former president of Sudan is, is too scared to leave Sudan. Um, uh, the, the, the Prime Minister of Kenya had his case dropped because he wouldn't allow any witnesses from Kenya to go to The Hague. Um, uh, um, you know, so I, I'm not saying it's working perfectly and, and so forth, but it has a lot of moral um, uh, weight behind it. And our job is to support it, is to support it. OK, it's easy to critique and say you're not doing this and you're not doing that. But this is an example where we're trying to bring international law to the individual level. We're trying to make people leaders who think they are above the law, and they usually are in their own country. We're trying to make them realize you may not be above the law globally. And that's a terrific lesson to have. So well, in, in okay. your book, uh, the UN role in promoting democracy. So when you have focused on that particular thing, I just checked that. It's very interesting, but the United Nations doesn't have any democracy at all because when you have a veto power and the Western, uh, Westminster type of democracy, which you have followed by Canada, Britain, and India, uh, there is no veto power actually. So, <laughs> but uh, even in USA, there is no veto power. Only president can do some budgetary matters, not about the when the Senate and the House of Representatives adopt a law, president rarely can veto. So the question here, with keeping a, a limited veto power, how even can uh, continue to be uh, demo promoting democracy? Okay. Um, you know, democracy is a powerful word. It's a good word, and we should keep using it, but it's a powerful word. Um, and it is also a continuum word. It does, you, you know, we've got to know where we can use it successfully and where we can't. It's not me saying this. Francis Fukuyama uh, uh, wrote about this. Democracy, as we know it, is very hard to scale up. Um, we understand how democracy works at the city level. We understand how it works at the national level. And we have a, 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 an excellent example with problems, but an excellent example of working at the regional level in the European Union. Um, um, but Fukuyama thinks, and I have to agree with him, we cannot scale up to the global level. So the UN never pretended to be a democracy. 
Um, it was promoting democracy in those places where democracy works, the nation, the city, and so forth. But to turn the UN into, into a democracy is, again, I mean, I think you need somebody with a bigger brain than mine to try to work out how you could make that happen. No, I appreciate that, that way you have... Can I have my it. last question? Yes, please, please, yes. <laughs> Okay. Yes. You're the boss, yes. of course. No, no, I'm not the boss. Uh, <laughs> Christina I have to show so critical, you know? <laughs> yeah. so critical everything. No, no, no. Really no I appreciate fine. Professor yeah. Rich about his uh, notion and his uh, uh, proposal because he said we have to start. So we need yep. to start. Definitely, definitely. But I like... No that. wonder he's one of my favorite teachers. Yeah. And, you know, and we are discussing very difficult issue, but only because of Roland, it has become quite, you know, we are taking it easy, in fact, because I have found that in many times when we discuss this kind of issue, things are not going the right way we want. But today, I think so far we are perfectly okay. So, uh, Roland, I liked, uh, you know, you mentioned about two things. One is global, which is very close to my area of interest. One is global governance and another one is human rights. So with regard to these two things, despite many, you know, limitations and everything that we have with regard to international laws and the UN system or the international agencies, we have respect for number of, uh, you know, institutions, those who are really working, passionately working to bring peace in this world, including UN, I will say. So how do you see that? Because there is an allegation against Israel that they are constantly violating human rights in Palestine. So how the international organizations or the agencies, they can, you know, play specific role in documenting or assessing this, whether they are violating uh, human rights yeah. or not. Where do we stand? Um, you know, I think the um, we've had we've had reports on this from institutions, the uh, Human Rights Council, the International Committee of the Red Cross, uh, Amnesty International. I mean, if I may make this may sound like a a, a, a petty distinction, but it's an important distinction. Um, occupied people actually don't have human rights in the legal sense. They have the rights associated with occupied people, that's humanitarian rights. So, you know, they don't have rights of assembly and free speech and vote and all those things. They're, that's peacetime rights. They're peacetime rights. They have the rights given to occupied people under humanitarian law. Now, what Israel tried to do was to sort of pretend that they were self-governing. Um, and that it was the Palestinian Authority that would, you know, look after all these rights. But that's the Palestinian Authority is only a shadow of a government. And the and Palestine is only a shadow of a state. The West Bank is only a shadow of a state. It's not the real thing. So, um, you know, it was an attempt by Israel to basically unload its responsibilities onto another group. What's the, you know, where should we go? I know this is sounding old fashioned, but ever since the 1967 war, the solution has been a two state solution. Exactly. And, and, and resolution 242 with all its constructive ambiguity and whatever is still a resolution about a two state solution. And I, I'm, you know, disappointed that we're sort of easily letting go of this idea. True. That's the only idea that will ultimately bring peace to the Middle East. The zero sum does not work. Um, one, one interview I have seen that uh, the current prime minister of uh, Israel said, uh, yeah, there is a two-state theory, fine, but their security, their police, their army, they shouldn't have anything like that. Everything is controlled by uh, Israel because whether it is a Palestinian independent state, because Iran will take over. So this, you know, it is not an independent country. It well, is well I mean, you can understand Israel's concerns. I mean, Hamas was the, the government of Gaza and they put together an incredible armory. Um, did they spend money on schools and hospitals? Of course not. They put together an incredible armory. And, and I have to, you know, grudgingly admire their war capacity, um, especially to, you know, not be... 
uh, um, seen by I Israeli or American or any intelligence and to be able to launch this uh, um, operation that they did to defeat all the electronic intelligence and so forth. Um, clearly, it was their biggest priority and they put everything into this priority and now the, they are suffering the consequences of that. And that too is not humanitarian. That's precisely like, are you responsible? representing your own people in many states that is not the issue although we are discussing a lot of negatives but i often try to say that often health is not visible disease is so how many conflicts a united nation has stopped we cannot see that the ones that have not been stopped are the ones that we discuss more because health i mean if I don't try to say to my child, uh, go play with X because that is a healthy child. But we always say, oh, somebody has a flu, so don't play with the child today. So it's, it's uh, health is not always visible. So yeah. we sometimes forget. And, 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 you know, that's one of the big lessons of UN peacekeeping over the years. It is a counterfactual, as you say. We don't know what would have happened without UN yes. peacekeeping. It would be a very difficult argument to say that things would be better without UN peacekeeping. It's almost inconceivable that that would be the case. Um, I, I think the UN has been able to mediate and and tamp down things and then stand between combatants and allow time to sort of calm things down. Um, maybe the part that is most difficult is to solve problems. Um, solving problems turns out to be something really difficult, but we try to limit and shrink the problems and try to manage the problems. That's the most we can do uh, as an international community. And, but it is all, a lot of it, the onus depends on the norm setting of individual states on what are the norms that they adhere to. And that could be the positive note that we can leave today with, with a little bit of flicker of light of possibilities and um, hopefully some of the steps that you so aptly describe in your book could could make a little different world global governance and uh, i is if you had a something like something to a little window of possibility that you could share with us today that kind of takes our mind off this rather gloomy state of the world, we would. You know, a number of countries are talking about a new phenomenon in foreign policy, a feminist foreign policy. Um, and what I'd like to see along those lines um, when um, Anthony, Antonio Guterres finishes his second term, I want to see a woman as Secretary General of the United Nations. Um, and I don't want that woman to be subject to the permanent five stranglehold that they've had every other Secretary General under. Um, and I, I think somehow or another, um, we might find new ways of talking about things and new ways of doing things. We've seen that in a number of countries. Uh, we saw it in New Zealand under a, a woman prime minister. We've seen it in, um, uh, in other countries, uh, in Germany under a woman prime minister. Let's get a woman secretary general and see whether we can make the world a better place. <laughs> and who is not a woman put in a flower vase, but a real woman who is passionate but that's that, the that way, positive that way the south africans with under the leadership of nelson mandela reconciliated with the end of apartheid that was a lesson big lesson but we have not taken over from that queue and we have not uh, utilized that lesson no. and and Donald, uh, that reminds me my uh, wfp world food programs day because we had a strategy that we saw that when resource goes to a woman the whole family is benefiting but when it goes to the man, it, you know, gets distorted or it's not. Priorities the are... <laughs> That's right. <laughs> not, not always. So, I mean, you know, there is, you know, there is a research. In fact, we did the research and we found that uh, really that is benefiting the family. But anyway, there, there is also... and, and the, the Brazilian Bolsa Familia, 
yeah. which was a, a, a sort of a bargain that if you send your children to school and have them vaccinated and so forth, we'll give the mother this amount of money. That's right. Yeah. It, not not the family, the mother. That's yeah. why it worked. Yeah. yeah. Anyway. So this, as I was telling my friends before we invited Dr. Rich, that he's a wonderful storyteller. So this is not the last time you come and chat with us. We would request you to come and encourage us and to talk to us again. Uh, we've been chatting for about a, an hour and thank you very much for, for coming as our guest today. I'm really honored and on behalf of uh, TV Metro Bail, we would really like to thank you for being here. Thank you, Shoikot. Thank you, Amal. I, I would like to just give a uh, vote of thanks in this regard that the way uh, Dr. Rich has uh, spoken with us she he is your teacher but the way he behaved and spoken that the academically he has subdued as the mom mentioned the uh, tension so hope his uh, uh, proposals can diffuse tension among the conflict in the conflict zone and the leaders we hope so thank you shokat and thank you very much christina imam i've enjoyed it um yes um, happy to come again thank, thank you. you so much thank, thank you good night thank you very much Bye-bye.